So good afternoon. Uh, thank you all, for all of you who came here. And I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Jia Wei Han on behalf of all our uh, CSE faculty and students. Uh, and it's my great honor to introduce him as our CSE Distinguished uh, Lecture Series speaker. Professor Jia Wei Han is Bliss Abel Professor of Computer Science from Illinois, uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he researches in uh, data mining, information network analysis, database systems, and data warehousing, and with over 600 journal and conf conference pu publications. He has served on uh, several uh, program committees for most major international conferences in the fields of data mining and database systems as a member and function co-chair. He also served as the founding editor-in-chief of ACM Transactions on Knowledge Discovery from Data and is serving as the director of Information Network Academic Research Center, supported by U.S. Uh, Army Research Lab. He's a fellow of ACM and fellow of IEEE and received 2004 ACM CKDD Innovations Award, 2005 IEEE Computer Society Technical Achievement Award, 2009 IEEE Computer Society Wallace McDowell Award, and 2011 Daniel Drucker Eminent Faculty Award at UIUC. And he's an author of a book, uh, Data Mining, Concepts and Techniques, and it has been used popularly as a textbook worldwide. Today, he's going to talk about uh, mining heter heterogeneous information networks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you much. Okay. That's good. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for uh, uh, Hong Lack's, uh, you know, nice introduction. Uh, I actually drove down here, but not uh, directly from UIUC because it's a long drive, you know. I actually drove down starting this morning from uh, Notre Dame because uh, uh, when, you know, computer science at Michigan invited me, I was thinking, uh, first, we do not have direct flight anymore to, to Detroit. The second thing is if you transfer from Chicago, it took about seven hours at least for all the trips. So instead of seven hours on the plane, I mean, or transfer, they just drive. Okay, it just took six hours maybe. Uh, plus, you know, I actually on the way, I came with some research friend in Notre Dame. They actually have asked me to give a talk for a long time. I never, I never promised I would go on a certain day. So that's the reason we arranged this Friday. The other one was Thursday. So that's the second uh, talk almost in two days. <laughs> so, but for this building, it's a very nice building. I actually came here, I think it's 2006 or so, with uh, some professor, but mainly in bioinformatics program. But I came to this building, give a one hour talk, because I only stay here one and a half hours. That's the reason. I still, this building is still very fresh to me. It's very nice, okay, thank you. So uh, for me, my discussion on this is mining heterogeneous information networks. Uh, it's a very exciting and it's also a relatively new field. Uh, the contributor, I should say, mainly from my PhD students, actually the first one, Ijo Sen, she's uh, graduating this year. Actually this talk, probably 80 or 90% is from her work, okay. And there are several other students contributing, like Mingji contributing on the classification part. Uh, Chi Wang contributed on the role discovery part. Xiaoxing contributed in the past quite a few uh, because he graduated, uh, joined Microsoft Research uh, you know, three or four years ago, three, three and a half. So he got actually ACM KDD dissertation award uh, for the initial work on information networks. But, uh, this talk, I did not include any of his work. So I just uh, got an acknowledgement because he, he did the initial one, okay. So uh, let's discuss about this. The first thing I want to discuss actually is why we want to explore the power of you know, structured heterogeneous network. What's the difference from the typical, say, social network analysis? Okay, all these I'm going to give, give you a discussion. Then I will go over uh, the several very interesting methods we developed. Okay. 
The first thing is everybody knows social network. I do not need the introduction. I just give you lots of logos. Okay, those are Facebooks and all these. Everybody knows. So if you look at this, besides Facebook, Foursquare, all these things, you get a Twitter, Yelp. You know, they, they all are different. They have a very different flavor. But I'm not going to introduce any of this. But I may use some of this. Okay, in some examples. But Overall, I should say, social network opened a new forum for many, many people to jumping in, not only from computer science, information sciences, and also from like even social parts. Actually, many, many people jumping into this part. But we are mainly going to discuss is we call heterogeneous information network, it's, which is different from the pure social network, like friends link with friends. If you got into Facebook, you say, oh. Every entity is a person. Then you link with them because you like them. Of course, you, you hate them, you won't link with them. So that's the, we, what we say is friends links. Okay? But they are all person. Okay? But if you think about a triple W, like, uh, you know, like uh, web or Google, okay? they have the pages link with pages. This is also homogeneous because those are all web pages. The link is just some kind of endorsement or something. Okay? But we are discussing more on what we call multiple typed structured heterogeneous network. Just give you one example, medical network. Okay. You got patients, you got doctors, you got treatment, disease, or even DNAs, all those things, they link together, but they, they are different. Okay. Doctor, even you say doctor link with patients, they play very different roles. Doctor link with doctors or patient link with patients, they are different from doctors link with patients, semantically. So to that extent, it's interesting. Okay. Then if you look at, a, for example, a bibliographic network, like a, we use DBRP all the time. They collect papers, but they contain authors, and also they contain venues, like conference and journals. And they have titles, they may have keywords, you have citations, all these things. You think about this, this actually is also multi-typed network, okay. which some people say, I'm also working on heterogeneous network. I'll give you an example, WordNet. Okay. All the words are linked, they, they are different. But WordNets, in most cases, the words are not typed. You think about this. They have so many different words. You just think everyone is somewhat different. They link them. But we are not studying this. We are studying typed heterogeneous network. But once you type them, okay, things become structured or semi-structured. Then it becomes quite powerful. The, 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 let's look at this. You probably will get this. That means you sort of, even they are huge, gigantic network, they are somewhat organized by typing, then the power emitter will show up. Okay. Let's just give you a simple one. Okay. This one actually is a co-author network, which is people linking with people because they are all co-authors. But this co-author, where you get it? Actually, most people say, I got it from DBRP. Remember, if you want to study those co-authors, just look at those links. You may say, who are the popular collaborators? Because it's, it's very dense, or many people, you have many, many fans out or something. But that doesn't make too much sense. If you think about it, you want to study who are the prominent researchers. Some researchers may not be collaborating with many people, but they are still prominent. Right? You cannot just, just based on number of links counts, you say who are the real hero. Right? So that's the case. You think about this network, it's come from your publications. You've got papers, papers have a title, you publish in some you know, rapid conferences, then you are here. That's the reason this one actually got rid of lots of information, but they are important information. Right? So if you want to preserve this information, you actually get a heterogeneous network, not homogeneous like author link with another author. You will also link with conference, with papers, with keywords, with all those things. Right? So this is the simplest way you can think. This is just authors, like a Bob or Mary. And these are just the, you know, conferences. You see, I publish one paper in this conference, build one link. If I publish three papers, I probably say my link to that, the weight is three, or I have three links. So, that's heterogeneous network. Even this one is the simplest one. It's only bipartite. Okay. What questions or what interesting things you can mine from this network? 
For example, we just take DBRP as the example. DBRP actually is a computer science bibliographic database. It contains like a, actually now it's like a 1.8 million records, and with uh, you know over half a million authors and uh, 10,000 conferences look like this. Okay, it contains still lots of data, but the data actually linked because you published five papers in this conference, they are linked with all, all these. Some question you think you cannot answer because you just do retrieval, you cannot. But if you do data mining, okay. For example, how the computer science research, research field is structured, how many subfields and sub-subfields. Can you give the whole hierarchical structure of the computer science just based on publications? And who are the leading authors on web search? or on um, probably graphic models or all these things. And you know, how those authors are collaborate, how they evolve, or whether they break up or whether they form a new group. Okay. And another thing interesting, actually this is Xiao Xin study, is how many Wei Wangs in DBRP just carry exactly the same name but the different people. And who is who, you know, is collaborator and publish which papers. He actually did a very interesting thing, almost uh, can identify them I mean, uh, reasonably accurately. Okay. And who is Search Brain's supervisor and when? Okay. You probably know Search Brain is Google's co founder, right? But he was a PhD student in Stanford. Okay. He did have publication entries, not only PageRank, but also something else. Okay. So, who, who is his uh, advisor? And at what time? Can you automatically just based on this find it? Okay. And can you predict what topics or what papers Chris Falusa is going to write in the next several years? That's a Chris Falusa, he asked me by himself. Okay. And we actually show uh, something can be done. Okay, it's very interesting. And that means we are viewing this DBRP not as a database, but as a heterogeneous information network. Then everything becomes alive. Okay. Let me just show you a few very interesting algorithms you probably will find. It's really exciting. Okay. I actually first think uh, we have two methodologies developed all by Yi Zhou San. I will show you these two methodologies with a few very interesting algorithms. One is integrating ranking with clustering and classification okay, in heterogeneous networks. So essentially, she develops one algorithm called rank class, clustering. Okay. And then actually got quite a few algorithms along with it. There's another girl called Ming Ji. She just joined us uh, two years ago. She actually uh, following this philosophy, doing rank-based classification, got a KDD algorithm, a KDD paper called rank class. We, we, we intentionally make this two pronunciation so close, but uh, the writing is different, okay. And another methodology called meta path based exploration. That means you are thinking this, this type thing actually has a meta type, it has this type. They form a path. You follow different paths, you carry different semantics. You can do a lot of interesting things. We are going to study these as well, okay. Let's first get into this rank class clustering algorithm. The general idea is this, everybody likes ranking, everybody likes clustering, but actually very few people are thinking these two things can work together. Why do you like ranking? I can give my own personal experience, I say, I must like ranking. You know, before PageRank came, I go to a conference, I went to a conference, what I, I ask, I ask people's URL. Okay. Why? I, I get a name card, I, I, you know, Carefully take those name cards. The reason is this. Okay. For example, if I met Christos Falosos, I said, give me URL. Of course, I know he's from CMU. Why I ask this? Okay. Remember, typical IR is an inverted index. If now I search on the web, you'll say 70,000, actually it's more than that if you really search Christos Falosos. 70,000 entries found. Okay. Where's his homepage? If his homepage is 70,000 right in the middle, it takes me days to find his homepage. Remember this, right? But PageRank, 
have some magic thing, finally can rank, you know, his homepage on the very top. I don't need name card anymore. Not only do not need name card, I don't need anything. I remember, I just want to find anything and go to Google, that's it. That's the power of ranking, okay? It's not because Google can find 70,000 entries. It's because Google can rank them, okay? Now, the second thing is clustering. Everybody likes clustering because if you do not group the similar things together, you will not be able to get the right entry. You think about it, you search something, the similar things are not there you actually have much more you know, frustration to find it. So, but whether these two things can get together, can work together, okay? Actually, the, the general philosophy is this. If most people, probably I, I don't have to introduce anything about clustering, you know you find clusters. But people doing clustering, the general methodology is they treat every object is identical, it's like a weight as one or something like this. Then they try to partition things to find different clusters. But in real life, should you treat every object identical? They have the same weight? Just thinking about it, we do the clustering of people, authors. Say so Chris Osfellows is supposed to publish 500 papers, famous professor, very influential, okay? And suppose I got one person, first year graduate student publish one paper in the KDD workshop, okay? So both are in the KDD field. But if I put Christos Fellows in the wrong cluster, what will happen? Okay, many things may change. But if I put the student in the wrong cluster, what will happen? Nothing will happen. Okay, of course for him it's, <laughs> it's not fair, right? <laughs> but you probably can see is clustering objects actually should be weighted differently. Why they should not, right? And this is common sense. But why all the clustering algorithms, they don't treat this way? But the problem people may say is, it's hard for me to find the right weight. That's right, okay. That's the trick, and she was playing. She basically saying, you know, if we can do, based on network, somehow we can figure out the ranking. Even we figure out in a very rough way, it may help my clustering. And once I get a little better clustering, I get a little back at better ranking, then it goes back and back. You know, that's like page rank. You think about this. Why I just get a bunch of pointers, the page rank can finally can find all sort of pages. It's just incremental. You find a tiny little difference, then you get a loop. Then everything becomes harder. That's the trick, okay? So let's think about this. If you see this is bipartite, the simplest network, it's so authors and conferences, okay? At the very beginning, we say we don't know how to, to cluster authors or cluster conferences, okay? But there's a general philosophy. If somebody published more papers in this conference, likely will be in this field. And especially you've published papers in both conferences quite a lot, likely these two conferences are in the same field or something like that. So that's the way you do clustering. And with this way to do clustering, you also have some way to figure out the rough ranking because you publish more papers in this field, likely you rank somewhat higher, okay? So with this idea, you can go into this ran initial ranking, then you go back to clustering, and clustering became better, you can get a better ranking, you get better ranking, get better clustering. So you go back and forth, done. Okay, you do really good. So then she worked out this one, essentially it's like an EM algorithm, okay? But it carries a real intelligence, it's initialization, you can do EM or k-means, you just randomly partition. But you have a sort of a ranking rules, like you publish more papers in this field, likely you rank a little higher in this field, okay? So you do the ranking, then you measure the space, you do the partitioning, you can adjust your cluster, you go back and forth, you repeat this one, two, three. Okay, you repeat until it gets stable, it's done, okay? So that's pretty simple, straightforward algorithm, okay? So if you convert this one into network, essentially this becomes a matrix, okay? 
This one is a conference suppose it's type X, author type Y. You actually get XX means conference link with conference. Initially it was empty, no conference link with the other. But they link with the conference via authors. Okay. Then the author, after many rounds, conference will link with conference more, and author will link author more, even you do not have a uh, co-author relationship. You still will be linked because you are closer. Okay. So with this idea, and she actually worked out a very nice algorithm. But the interesting thing is this. You know the ranking, you will disagree with me at the very beginning. You say, people publish more papers, should be ranked higher. What about I publish more in a very junky place? OK, <laughs> should I rank number one in the world? OK, so actually you need some simple rule to guard against it. Because you probably know, even MIT has a group use random number generator, generate some paper, you submit to a conference, it's accepted. Okay, of course that must be a junky conference. But why you can distinguish them? Actually, it's very easy to distinguish. You say your paper got rejected, you said, I said my own workshop, all my paper will be accepted. Fine. Do you think other people will join you? Do you think you get this workshop, you accept all of my own papers? If I were a researcher, I would feel ashamed of it. I would not send paper there, right? So it's a very easy to get a rule like this, OK? We say highly ranked conferences attract many papers from many highly ranked authors. It simply says, if you are reputed, you probably feel ashamed that you go down there to a junky conference, automated number generator, you are in the same category, right? So that's the, actually. We just code these four rules, which actually is very easy to code. And philosophically, you probably know, we do have one. One called simple ranking is just you publish more papers to get higher rank. This one actually is saying we look at the conference venues, whether it's rapid or not. And uh, authors, whether rapid or not, we base on these three rules including collaboration, which to some extent you can, you can tune them. For example, if you publish with, say, you know, Albert Einstein, likely you probably will be quite good on physics, right? Otherwise, our Einstein will not want to, you know, even co-author with you. So, so we actually got this coded into matrix form, including the last one actually is elastic. Elastic means this alpha can be adjusted. If you say collaboration is very important, put more weights on collaboration. If it's not so important, you can, you can reduce the weight. Okay. But anyway, we take this, we run through our you know, test on the DBRP data sets. Very interestingly, you actually can see the convergence. Okay. You can see here at the very beginning, these two colors all mixed up. That means ranking is mixed up, the clustering also mixed up. But using this algorithm, after a few iterations, the ranking become very well separated, clustering also become very well separated. Of course, this test is we use two fields. One is we call it database and data mining. The other field is computer architecture and uh, you know, like uh, hardware. We assume uh, people actually usually okay, do not publish both in both fields. Okay? Uh, of course, there are people who pu may publish in both fields, but in general, they don't publish in both fields. That's why you can see it's where separated clusters. Okay. But if you got it like KDD and machine learning, maybe it's hard to split them. Right? So we use this. We took uh, uh, over 2,000 conference, 20,000 authors uh, for those many years. We do this running test, just like say whether we can cluster conferences well. We set up like a K is 15. We got this result. Uh, you probably can see so overall, for example, if you are in information retrieval, you probably can see the SIG IR, AC multimedia. Of course, you said K is bigger, the multimedia will be separate with SIG IR. But here, actually, you can see these are the you know, cluster for information retrieval. These will be the cluster for theory, this cluster for AI, this cluster for network. Okay. So actually, we did not put any knowledge inside. That means that those computers knows nothing. But still can do very good cluster and not too bad ranking. You look at the CIR rank number one, this is like VRDB or Soda, or even you say Soda, Stock, Fox, 
This is probably the top three you know, conference in theory. But anyway, so this shows it does have some power. Okay. Of course, if you want to go deeper, you say, not only I want to partition database, as within database we want to know query processing or you know, data model or data mining or data warehousing, but they all submit to the same conference. So it becomes hard. How do you do it? You need more information. That's why the bipartite one is only powerful enough if they are very well separated by the conferences. Okay. But you need more, for example, you need a term, like a keywords, title information. Actually, we only use title, we even do not use abstract. Okay. Take title, we look at their terms. So we got this you know, star network. Star network means research paper center, but you get author, venue, and term as a star network. The interesting thing is you do the clustering and ranking, they will nicely separate this one into multiple stars. But every star has exactly the same structure. It's paper, venue, author, title. It's more like a DNA, you chop them, you, you, you partition this into many small parts, they still have the same DNA structure. Okay. But the real contents are different. This database, hardware, theory, you can well separate them. Okay. And I just show you these numbers, you may not like to read it, but I just show you where the red parts becomes interesting. For example, when we run through this, what you see is like Chipper AI, everybody knows this is the AI conference. You can see the third column is red, it's, it's a distribution wise, this is the largest distribution. Then you see whose second column is red. You will see CVPR, ECML, uh, then ICML, HKI, you know, those are all AI conferences. You probably can see why we can easily separate them, right? Because the distribution, after a few rounds, the distribution is very well separated. And not only you separate the conferences, you can see this separation goes down to all entities. This one is go to, this is the terms, this is the conferences, these are the authors. Okay, see, if you do not know which field this is. You look at the title, you look at the, the keywords, the database systems, data query, system management, object, relational. This is database field, right? Everybody knows. You look at those other conferences of their top database conferences. These are the authors. Of course, I cannot say these ranking is most authoritative, but at least give you something pretty good. Those are very well-known authors, right? Like. Uh, David Deutsch, like uh, Mike Carey, Jagadish, uh, all here, okay. Then let's look at, with this, we did not have any training, you think about this, okay. Then I got another student, Ming Ji, she came, she says, we do not have any training, why we don't put some training? It's not that hard to put training, right? So she put training and tested, okay. Got another algorithm called rank class, classification, okay. The general philosophy is this. You may labor, for example, say data mining, you may put some, you know, like a black, uh, blue labels there. The database, you may put a green label there. They do knowledge propagation because they link more, they, t they tend to propagate some distribution down to the others, okay? Based on this competition, some you do not know, you also will get labels, okay? Actually, not only that, she actually using, the, using this workout, quite a few formulas are using graph regularization technique. I will not get, get into detail. That one published in the PKDD 2010. Then she actually used Ijo, the other student idea, saying why every object should be treated identically. Okay. The thing, if you think about, even for classification, I'll give you a training set. If this training set is very highly regarded conference or highly regarded author, I do not say they have the same weight as first year grad. Okay. If you put Jagadish there, he's a big one in database. You put a first year grad, even you misclassified, so what? Okay. But you don't want to misclassify Jack. Right? So that's the reason you probably can see this rank class, ranking and classification also can work together. And she did it. And the interesting thing is this. She did a, give a very small number of training set. You don't, actually the interesting thing is this. If you give the best training set to the top conferences, you almost for sure get a very good result. 
But she was not doing that because she was thinking this one is a little cheating. It's a, it's a little cheating, okay? She gives something a little ambiguous. It's more like a authors and the papers. Remember, author and paper, even for me, you say, whether I'm a data mining person or a database person, it depends on who views it, right? You say, people in the database community say, this guy is a database person. People in data mining say, oh, he's the data mining person. Well, it depends, right? It depends on also where you publish your conference uh, papers. So we take this, we actually compete with a few very good network-based or some like a, you know, like a regularization, you know, these algorithms. We actually found with the network and with the rank-based classification, you get very high classification accuracy. Okay, you, if you look at this, you, you look at number of training sets you really need. Okay. We got 14,000 papers, 14,000 authors. When we train them, the lowest one is 0.1% means you just need 15 papers and 15 authors. You take those as a training set. Okay. Then you give them labor, then everything sort of becomes trained. Okay. It's a, it, because you use network, Actually, you can see we can reach just these so few examples. We can reach like 80.2 or 80, 82 or 83% accuracy comparing to the other algorithms. Remember, this 25% is essentially random guess because you have four fields. We, we basically use database, data mining, information retrieval, and AI. These four fields, if you Got 25% you are doing random guess. Okay. But here you can see the, the, the accuracy is pretty high. But if you look at the concrete case, you will be really con convinced because not only we give good classification accuracy, but also we give good ranking. Okay. Look at the conference, these four fields. Okay. For example, if, if you know like uh, AI field, you'll probably say this actually is pretty good ranking for the top AI conferences. Okay. Or IR, you probably look at this, you say SIG IR, this is very, pre you may argue with me, say CIKM and Triple W, I would rank Triple W higher. But Triple W is more spread, not only on IR, they on many other things. Okay. And CIKM is a little more concentrated, but not as concentrated as ECIR. That's why ECIR actually rank higher than CIKM. Of course, CI, SIG IR is always no question, it's number one. But if you look at the keywords, that's automatic, no human instruction. You look at the retrieval information, web search, text. Can you get even better ranking or better five keywords to replace these five? I thought about it. I just cannot find any other five words can, can beat this five in IR, right? So that simply says this one give you so small number of training examples, then finally give you very nice Results, right? So it's, a, it's elegant. So this one is, we call integrated ranking with clustering and classification. Okay. Then we go a little further to look at this, we call meta pass based exploration. Okay. Why meta pass? The interesting thing is this we look at this, we essentially, for, for the papers or authors, we take you know, the publications, those are the key parts. But remember, actually, there are some other things we did not put in. For example, publication city or, or publication year, we did not put in. Okay. The reason is we think they are unimportant. Right? The city cannot decide the quality of an uh, uh, author. Right? You're publishing California or publishing Hawaii, actually, maybe it's the same. Okay, same weight. So we don't care that. We drop it. But in principle, how do you know it? Okay. Uh, we play with this because we know it. Right? We did not put it in. But if we put the wrong information in, you get the wrong thing. Right? So actually we are thinking about what about we explore this meta pass. But to explore meta pass, the first important thing is you follow this meta pass, you get similarity, you get a semantics. How do you check the two things are similar? Okay. For example, who is most similar to Chris's fellows? Okay. I actually asked this question to Chris himself. He said, that's hard to say. It depends on how you judge it. If you judge closeness, means I co-author papers, those are my students. 
If you judge close names because we publish in the same conferences, those are the same level researchers, right? So that's a very good answer. Simply says, you need to go through the meta paths. Okay, one is only go through the co-author paths. The other is go to the co-conference paths. They're different paths. Then they carry different semantics. Okay, in that sense, we actually work out one called path-based similarity. Okay, this similarity actually is very, very easy to compute. You can see this. This similarity, ij, has two objects. Okay, how do you calculate this similarity? You based on i goes to j follow this meta path, how many paths you will go. Okay, then you look at the i goes back to i follow this meta path. Remember, author, like a Christos, is author. Okay, uh, me is author. Okay, so you look at this. They all go to the same, same path, but you know, one, you think uh, Christos goes to Christos is also another author, but just the same name, right? Christos goes to Christos, follow the path, this meta path, and it can, this meta path can go to the other authors as well, right? So that's the reason you use this meta path, this, go to self, this meta path, okay? This is the average of this one, you know, this is go to the other ones, you know, just, just divide by their average. So it's very easy to measure. But this measure becomes very powerful, very interesting. Okay. Actually, people in the past study you know, the, the, the similarity measure. There are the pass count, random walk, pairwise random walk, there are many, many things. With this, actually, people, people work out quite a few measures. I do not try to compare all the measures. I give you two very popular ones, one called personalized page rank, another called sim rank. Actually, both were developed by Stanford group. Sim rank was done by Jennifer Williams group. Okay. But these two, we actually say, if you want to find who is most similar, which, which measure you want to use, okay, just the thinking same meta pass. We actually work on a new one called pass sim, pass based similarity. For these three measures, we actually took one real person, Ang Hai Duan. Why I took Ang Hai Duan? The first thing is he was my colleague in, in UIC. We were almost in the same group, no, next door almost. So I know him very well. But he actually left UIC. Wisconsin grabbed him. You know, he joined Wisconsin. Actually, this, you probably also know Jignish Patel also grabbed from Michigan. Those are two like young stars. They all grabbed by Wisconsin group. They joined Wisconsin. But I want to see who Ang Hai Duan is most similar to who, okay? And it's interesting is this, okay, you use personalized page rank, okay? What you see is most similar is Philip Yu, Jiawei Han, Hector Garcia, Melina, Gahan, Wycombe. Do you agree? Probably you don't because Ang Hai was a assistant professor. He just joined us, of course, a grad by Wisconsin, okay? But, he actually cannot compete with Philip because Philip has like 700 publications already. Okay, he probably got the highest publication at DBRP. So how could you, these two are the most similar ones. Okay. But person page rank, you know what the page rank is. Who is most authoritative? You just point to who. And you grab probably Albert Einstein, so most similar. <laughs> I dare not to say that, right? <laughs> so that's the reason this may not be good for comparing similarity. And it seems rank actually grab somebody I even do not know because he look at diversity. Random walk. Okay, you walk down there, you grab somebody very far away. Okay, they have some similar patterns, but that's too far away. Okay. But if you look at the past sim, you probably get it astonished. An Hai Duan actually is most similar to Jignish Patel. Okay, they both grab by Wisconsin guys. Okay. Of course, these several other guys is also star, like Jin Yang is a star in Duke. Rene Miller actually is a young star in Toronto. Actually, they were all at the same level. Remember, we have over half a million authors. This past team immediately grabbed these several guys. You think it's magic? Actually, that's the power of this path-based similarity, right? Think about this. So with this, we really go down to Christos Falosus. You see, we say, who is most similar to Christos Falosus? Actually, that's exactly like Chris Vazoros himself said. It depends on which path, which semantic path you want to use. Actually, we use 
APA pass is author, paper, author. What's the closest one? It's co-authors because it's linked by the same paper. So with this pass, you can see Christos follows us. Who is most similar? Spiros Papadimitriou, who is, a, who is a, from Christos' point of view, this is the star student because they co-author most papers. And Ji Meng San, including Yuri Leskovic, now is in, in Stanford University. But Yuri, of course, is younger. He's published less papers than Spiros. But anyway, you look at this. But on the other hand, these are pretty low. It simply says they are not really comparable to Christos Falusa. But they compare to others, they are still more similar based on APA pass. But if you look at the APCPA, this means author climb up to paper, then climb up to conference. They share a conference, they climb out to paper, co to another author. This is co-conference pass. But based on co-conference pass, actually Chris is most similar to me. <laughs> okay, actually this is nothing magic. I, I thought about it, I think it's right, because Chris has published mostly in both database conference and data mining conference. I publish this also in both database and data mining conferences. You can hardly find another guy actually doing both. So that's the reason. They, they, they got this, and Rakesh Agar actually is also, because he's a database guy, is also a data mining guy. So it, it's including Jan Pei, my own student, is both database and data mining. So that's actually, this, this is pretty accurate, because the Jagadish is also doing something both on database and data mining. So you probably see it's a very, very good you know, similarity, if you think about this. It's also grabbed from half a million author, right? So it's just magic. And we took this one, go to Flickr. What we want to find is which picture is most similar to this picture. We just take this picture. You actually can see the sensitivity of the pass. You look at this sensitivity, this ITI is image tag image. That means you share a common tag, you're most similar. You think this is reasonable? Sometimes it is, it is, but people tagging things sometimes a little random. They have bias. Okay. So what you can see is those flowers, of course, you can say similar to this lotus flower, but is a bird similar to this lotus flower? You probably will argue with them, right? Of course, you say this is wrong tag, but how could you judge it? Okay. Actually, we go a little further, not only using tag, but also using group tag. Remember. They not only tag some particular image, they, tag, they also tag which group it is. Okay. And then you can see using both tag and group tag, you look at those pictures. Those are all lotus flowers. You look at this. You can see this guy is the number one similar. It's not even lotus flower. It's another flower, right? But as you see, those are all lotus flower. Even this guy from picture-wise is nothing red or nothing blossom, but it's still very similar because it's the lotus flower, right? So you can see the magic thing can happen from humans' muddy semantics. You use different meta paths, you use a collective knowledge, you actually can get it. So this meta path is so magic, then it, the student, E. Joe, and she got excited. She said, this meta path could be the key to solve the semantics problem. So then she was doing one interesting thing is past predict. Has predicted, actually this question was more like the race by Christos Palosa himself. Because we give a talk, uh, I give a keynote speech in PKDD 2010. And he gave a same key keynote speech on a different day. He was there, I was there. He listened to me, then he immediately raised question. He said, your network is magic. Can you predict which paper I'm going to write next year? Okay, I say, probably not. Okay, I don't, yeah, he, she says, he says, even I myself cannot predict what paper I'm going to write. How could you predict? Right? So that's, that's true. That's interesting. And I brought back to each one. I said, Christos gave me a tough question. I said, can I predict what paper he's going to write next year? I said, I cannot. OK. Uh, and he's, she says, probably we should think about this twice. <laughs> Maybe we can do it. OK. So actually, she saw back and forth. She says, probably it's too easy to predict roughly what paper he's going to write because it's just based on fears or something. Of course, the exact title he cannot work out. But predict who he's going to collaborate is more challenging. I say, how could you predict? 
I said, I cannot even predict the next five years which student will follow me. How can I predict the next five years who I'm going to co-author? He said, maybe if it's highly ranked, the most popular authors, those existing groups, you can predict who you're going to collaborate. That's reasonable. So we, we start working on this. And while we work, we use this magic of MetaPass. Okay. So that means we use, we call this one the relation prediction, not link prediction. You probably know link prediction is which link, like which Facebook guy you want to link together. It's called link prediction. But that's link is homogeneous. It's, it's a friends with another friend. Okay. This one is you actually, which paper you are going to write, which conference you are going to send, or which co-author you are going to, it's, it's heterogeneous. This is what we call relationship prediction. We draw this meta pass. This meta pass, you can see paper. You have paper citation. You write, this is the author. You have a topic, which are keywords. You have venue, those are conference and journals. Then you got this, this is the magic graph we got. This we call meta graph for DBRP. Okay. Then we take this meta graph. Essentially, if you want to predict the co-authors, okay, the co-authors is here. This APA means co-author because you author the same paper. But we can use all the other meta paths. For example, author work on this paper. This paper cite, this arrow means cite. Cite the other paper, the other paper authored by this author. These two maybe later become co-author, right? So we, based on this, we work out for lens, this is the lens two, this lens three, this lens four, we say up to lens four, we look at it to see which meta paths will play more role in this prediction. Think about this. Uh, of course, you can say, what about an even longer one? You know, once the lens becomes very, very long, sometimes semantically it becomes very, very weak. Right? Remember, we have the six you know, degree of separation. That's, you know, somebody in Africa, I even do not know, I, I link with them within six, you know, diameter. So that's sometimes it's too much, right? So we took actually lens four, but it does make, make something meaningful. For example, look, even you look at this lens four, it's author published paper in certain venue, but there's another author published paper in the other, in the same venue. They could later become co-authors, right? Think about it. If you are publishing the same ICM error, maybe later you, you, you become co-author. Okay. So we took this. Then we do, based on the training, we work out their p-values. You probably know you, if you do the regression, you do all these analysis, you can work out these p-values. And also you, you know the p-value is lower, actually the link is stronger. It's very high, it's kind of a noise, right? So we actually look at this using our, the training set we found this is e to the power of minus you know, 174, that's pretty low, right? So we took those several low ones, we said those are the four star predictors, okay? Those are the four star predictors. Those like this is basically is noise. You better not use it, okay? You probably will agree with me. For example, you, you look at this guy, you say, why is it noise? You can see, this author work in this paper, this paper side, this paper, this paper side, this paper, and author by this guy. This might probably already pass away, right? <laughs> so how could you co-author with it? So, uh, uh, of course it could, may not, but you know, just too far away. So that's why it's not a very good predictor, okay? So we based on this, and she actually work out this regression, you know, based on this to do prediction. Some magic things happens, okay? We try. Originally, I told her, how could you predict co-authors? Because I even do not know who are my students, okay? who will be my student in the next several years. Actually, what she actually used is training data is earlier data. Okay? Then the prediction data actually is later data, but we already know it. You just hide it. You say, uh, DBRP, you cannot see anything beyond 2002. That means 2003 to 2009 is something you want to predict. Okay? But you can see anything history. Longer one, okay. Then I pick a one, I say, who is the best one? It was my previous student, Jan Pei, because he got a PhD in 2002, okay, from me. 
That's the best time he became free agent. He can go out with anybody anymore, right? Because of course, I, even when he was a student, I never restricted him to go out with others. But you know, he naturally would co author me uh, with me more than the other known researchers. So once he become free agent, we predict based on our thing, we predict the top five, you know, candidates as a co author in the next several years. Interestingly, actually four of them really become true. Okay. The only one guy not true actually happened to be his lab mate. Okay. That means they actually they both got PhD from me. But they probably psychologically, I don't know what's the reason socially or psychologically, they may not quite like each other. They both are professors, but they never collaborate in the next uh, you know, five or eight years. So I can never code those social or psychological things inside. But anyway, it's pretty interesting prediction. Actually, they, she actually also predicted me, like uh, from the year 2002 data, predicted me top, top uh, 10. Uh, of course, I know every one of them, for example, like Jagadish, but I never co author with Jack. Okay. So uh, his, her prediction is not quite right. Of course, there are many social or, or some other reasons. It's not a psychological reason. I, I, I actually <laughs> not really have anything, you know, uh, unhappy with Jack. But anyway, what you can see here is Hans Peter Greger, like uh, Sharagora, uh, we actually collaborate. Actually, the Bing Liu, I, I did collaborate with him, but beyond his, uh, her time, because I collaborated with him in 2010. And she said, that doesn't count, because the finish is, is 2009. So that, then, but Christos Falosos, actually, we, I collaborated with him to co-edit a book. But that won't count, because it done, it, it's, the book is not in DBRP, so it won't count. So, the, so uh, the qualification is only two, but it's still pretty good ones, right? So it's uh, interesting because there are so many, you remember there are so many candidates. It's like 11,000 candidates. Okay. So uh, actually the one, I skip one, it's very interesting, is predict when. Not only you are going to do this, when you are going to do it. Uh, that one actually, because of time, I will not have time to, to introduce it. It's published in just uh, got accepted by Wisdom 2012. So if you, are, you like it, you can go down to my webpage to download it. Then the last one I'm going to show on this prediction thing is the role discovery. The role discovery actually was done by another student called Chi Wang. Okay. What he did is this. In, uh, we got a big army research grants. For the DBRP data or any network data, we want to predict the hidden roles. For example, the army want to do this. Okay, you got a very messy communication networks. You want to find who is the the chief, like Bin Laden, okay, and who is insurgent, who is the CR lead. You want to predict this. You think it can be predicted? Okay, of course, Bin Laden. It happens finally. He never really on the email or anything communicate with others. So he just tried to completely hide himself from outside. But you think about this, okay. If you just based on communication patterns, you work out a structure like this, then the insurgent likely will be the outmost one. The CR lead likely will be something like here. The, the rear chief could be here because you think the insurgent will directly communicate with Bin Laden? No way, because you can capture Bin Laden the second day. Right? So that's the reason this structure actually is very rare. Even the army will agree because no full soldier directly dare to communicate with their general. You think about this, they come in with a squalid, then squalid report to, you know, there are lots of hierarchies. Right? So we based on this, what Shi Wang was to want to get is from DBRP data, nobody else, uh, nothing else. You cannot see the web. You predict who is whose advisor and when. Okay. It simply says you need to predict. Remember, DBRP has no association, never say this paper. I mean, from DBRP data itself, you're from University of Wisconsin or Michigan. Okay. You, you have no such information. Just author, paper, conference, that's it, right? So, but based on this data, he actually worked out this called constraint-based graph. Okay. The graph contained author, paper, uh, starting time, ending time, and then work out the ranking score. Actually, the interesting thing is, 
he mainly based on two heuristics everybody will buy. One said the advisor usually will have longer publication history, has more publications than the advisee at the advising time. Okay. That means when you do the advising, that time usually the professor has more publication than student and a longer publication history. Do you believe it? I believe it because if I have much less publication than my student, they will not follow me, right? So that's probably the right. Another one is you say, once advisee become advisor, and he or she will not become advisee again. I deeply believe so because if I become professor, I don't want to be a student anymore, right? <laughs> so, so that's probably it's quite right. So since these two rules are agreeable by anyone or any country, no matter you got PhD in England or, or, or Japan or, or US, probably it's the same. Okay. Then we use this two rule, then we plus some training set. Then we got a pretty high accuracy actually on the advisor advice relationship. What I can show you a few people you probably be convinced is very interesting. Okay. One guy we put we take is David Black. Okay. If people working in in AI or in in information retrieval, they all know David Blake. David Blake got, now is a professor in Princeton. Okay? And we predict he has two advisors. One is Michael Jordan, another is John Lafferty. Okay? Actually, it happens to be true is Michael Jordan, who is a Berkeley professor, okay, is working on, on information retrieval, AI, or whatever you want to say. And we predict the year is 01 to 03, the other one is 05 to 06. Of course, 01 to 03 may be a little conservative because you take longer to get a PhD. But actually, because they did not publish together yet. So that's why you can you dare not to say it's even earlier. But you can see the graduation date. Actually, it's not too bad. The other advisor actually is a postdoc advisor. The time is quite right. Then, actually, the student Shi Wang used my own student, Hong Chen, put it there, say, she, already, she just got a PhD in year 2008. Say, where's her advisor? Okay. Then found one advisor, Chang Yang, another is me. Actually, Chang Yang was her master advisor. The time is right. Actually, the, the PhD advisor is me. That time is also right. And then he said, I predict somebody never got PhD. Okay. He took search brand. Okay. You probably know search anyway because he is a Google co-founder. And he found actually his advisor is Rajiv Madhwani in Stanford. And that's the time. Probably it's too short to get a PhD, which is true. He did not get a PhD, but he got a Google. Okay. So that's probably it's more, more than a PhD. But anyway, that's really also the truth. Except we cannot say this. This is an advisor advice, but never say guarantee graduation, right? But that's actually it's very interesting. People actually got it. This is in last year KDD conference. Finally, I want to show you when the people got excited, people were thinking this information network can do something magic if you import more data. Okay. And I got another group of students actually led by Tim Wenninger, who is my PhD student. And doing something like a directly get a mining web structures and then integrate with this information network, or DBRP. What he was doing is this. He says, whether you can grab anybody, like from University of Michigan, you get a computer science professor, grab one. You can grab all of the CS professor out. No more than no less of their homepage. Can you do that? And actually he found you can do that in a very nice, easy way. Is this. If you assume, okay, people, no matter in which institution, once they set up a web page, they sort of somewhat structured. For example, the computer science, the, 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 the information management, the director, they give you the space, they say all these computer science space is here, then the web structure is here, they, and actually they are at the same identical level. Right? You can grab them. Okay. So based on this, he actually worked out uh, this kind of structure. Is you start from HTML based on their structure, you go layer, and you can cross another page, you cross another page, you go back and then forth. You actually can 
accurately based on the structure to grab their pages. And you see those are siblings. Okay. That's very interesting. And that result I probably can show you is most interesting thing is this. He actually tried for all the US representatives and senates, uh, you know, like a Congress and Senate. The interesting thing is you probably know when the re when the Democrats on, was on power, you, the web page only show all the things on the Democrats. I mean, some part of the committee, because the, the Republicans were not formed committee. But actually, their web page, everything is there. He could find both and all the structures on the committee. It simply says, one night if the election changes, the thing, the committee all become Republican. That happens. The web page actually did not really change. They just change the links. Something become visible. Actually, he found all of them. Okay, it's very interesting. And another interesting thing is the worst performance actually is the computer science faculty. Why? You see, those are all 100% recall and precision. The computer science, he could not do it. And I say, why cannot do it? He said, the computer science faculty is just too tricky. They put their homepage on the Facebook or LinkedIn. It's not in their, their original space. How could you find it? Based on this structure, almost all the other people, like, like a football ones, Amazon, you can find it, all these things. Like a football, he picked a Illinois, which is not a very famous, I mean, Illinois football is never so famous. He picked a Illinois, he put a one football player of Illinois. He actually found over 10,000 football players at the same level. Okay. And uh, the football, he put in Illinois and formed all the football teams because they all structure in the same structure. It's very interesting. But the computer science one can never reach 100% recall or precision. The reason is the computer science people are just too tricky. Okay. They, they play with the web and the other people they don't. Okay. But anyway, with this, he found more structures and doing the integration with the information network. And finally, we'll do something magic. That's ongoing work. Okay, that means he is still digging this part, and we are integrating the, the information network, uh, DBRP data, with the students, with the professors. And finally, what we want is some people want to apply any place. They say, I'm interested in you know, games or toys. You go down there, click the toys, you probably can find out who are doing research on toys. We, we want to do that. Of course, now we still ha haven't achieved it yet, but it will be very interesting for people applying PhD program or something. Okay. But anyway, what you probably can say is the heterogeneous information network simply says, you think the very messy network, you put some type information in, which usually people will do. Okay. Then things become somewhat semi-structured. Then the power of links can be thoroughly explored. That makes things very interesting because the more data put in, the more information you can dig out instead of thinking more messier, you know, you, you, your handle. Actually, things become more structured. It's kind of magic, but it's true, okay? So with this one, we actually, are, uh, the, the lab with this uh, Ejo's work, actually our lab got more than 10 students now working on information network because people got excited. Say, if we can do that, why we just get a first wave? Everybody claim, you know, some fruit results. So that's the reason we are working on. You'll probably see those are the paper. Actually, most are this student, Yi Zhou San. You probably see most are her paper. Okay. Uh, and some of the conference tutorials or something. We actually did a conference tutorial in uh, SIGMOD, KDD, ICDE, and I actually got a keynote speech in quite a few conferences. I have to credit her because majority of these contents are actually from her research. So it's a really, really you know, great to work with some really good students. So this is one I gave a talk uh, actually in, in Athens. Okay. On top of the Acropolis, you you go down, you take pictures. This is, this must be like two or three thousand years ago. You know those relics. So it's really nice. Okay, I finished my talk. So I would love to get more questions or discussions. Thank you.
Yes. Actually, first one is uh, when I see you uh, rank class, uh, I don't remember the name. Yes, it rank class. Uh, okay. uh, you probably use uh, some sort of uh, recursive uh, integration. I mean, uh, here you have a cl class, a cluster, yes. and you're ranking. Yes. And based on this ranking, you improve your cluster. Yes. And uh, you, sa you, you said that uh, if you your ranking is better, in some sense, you can improve your clustering. Yes. So my question is, since the, the clustering is algorithm itself is uh, unsupervised, right? Yes, yes. So how do you judge whether or not you have a better result? OK, yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, remember, clustering is unsupervised. The rule you give provide a little supervision. You, you, you think about this. You say, if people publish more papers in the highly ranked conferences, you, know, you, you, you yourself get more reputed or something. That's a reasonable rule. So you get these rules, you know, like back and forth. You can enhance it. So you, sort of, we cannot say completely unsupervised. You got a little knowledge feed into this one. But the, the, the magic actually is the network itself actually contain the inherent structures. You think about this? OK. If you suppose you are working on data mining, you say, I actually publish paper in KDD, in ICDM, in SDM, those conferences. So if you publish all in these three conferences, not only you, but probably many other researchers publish this, naturally, these several conferences will be clustered together into a data mining field. Do you agree? Yeah. So even I say it's complete unsurprised, but your network structure itself will automatically take some people glued together into one cluster. Okay. That means inherently there are some knowledge structures. We just did not know. But when you publish, it's not random. That's the same as page rank. You think of why page rank can work. It's just people endorse the other one. It's not random. Okay. Maybe somebody random, but collectively it's not. That's why inherently this structure can tell a lot of things. Okay. But on the other hand, it's a very good question in the sense whether you trust every link or whether you weight every link the same. Actually, if you look at this meta pass, if you look at this, you'll probably know that's exactly what we currently are working on is this. If you look at just, uh, I give you this one, you look at this, we partition this into two parts. One is ranking working with clustering and classification. Another is MetaPath. We actually did not really link this two yet. Okay. That's the linking between these two paths into one is currently Ijo, she's working on. It simply says she wants to put MetaPath as a supervision to guard this. For example, okay, if you say I want to cluster not only those Researchers, I want to cluster, say, writing stars. Think about this. Current writing star, not 20 years ago writing, writing star. Then the year becomes very important, right? Think about this. If I want to cluster writing stars, what I do? I would have a, I would use this meta pass. Because this meta pass will say year will play an important role. Actually, I can even train them. That's exactly what we, we, we are doing. We do some training. Say, what is writing star? I give you a bunch of writing stars. Based on this writing star, they found actually this year pass weights very high. Then we will take a year as an important thing to do clustering. Then we'll give you the writing stars instead of fading, fading stars, right? You probably see, then probably. You know, some very big name probably got retired, so you were not credit in sight. Right? So that, 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 that's the magic of MetaPass. We haven't used it in this rank-based clustering. We are integrating the both. OK? Actually, I have another question. Yes. Oh, sure. So how many pass schemes you have in the MetaPass? Actually, I have seen that you have a lot of pattern of in pass schemes. Yes. But how do you decide it? OK, yeah. That's exactly, if you look at the prediction, what we are doing is there are many, many potential path schemes. Okay. The first important thing is very long paths 
may not be that interesting. Okay. Very long paths may not be interesting. Then the remaining usually will be de determined by training. That means you give me, you give me hints, I will try to find out which meta path is more important. That, that's exactly this process. You can see with so many meta paths, we only pick up a few. Generate, this is all the possible things you have in your schema. Oh. I mean, up to lens four, right? Yes, yes? Um, with the clustering classification, yes. um, you, you showed these great results with very little training data, you could get 88% accuracy. Yes. Um, what happens if you get a lot of training data? Does it go up to high 90s or? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, you were saturated to some point, yes. okay. The reason is this, the data itself is somewhat noisy. For example, you class me, you classify me as a data mining person. Some people classify me as a database person. So, I mean, no matter a paper or a person could be ambiguous. So finally, once you, even for example, my ranking could be high because you get a lot of papers. But this high guy is also split into two. So then, you know, things become a little little muddy, so you can never clean it up perfectly. So there's right. a saturating There's a saturating at, point. At 88 or? Not quite, it's, it's reasonably high if you look at this, but you will saturate, if you will saturate some point, we haven't found a very smart way to go even higher, okay? If you look at this, you'll probably see, actually, this one is accuracy on authors, this is accuracy on papers. This is accuracy on conferences. Actually, accuracy on conferences, very easy you can get pretty high for almost anybody because the conference is not so ambiguous. But if you got uh, papers, you probably see you're saturated at a certain point. Because the paper, how do you classify this paper? Sometimes it's very hard. Okay, it, it, it relates to many things. Right? So that's the reason, you, that's a very good question. Some places, you probably will stop there, or if you want to do more, you have to play new tricks. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, you mentioned author name disambiguation in your introduction. Yes, yes. I wonder if you did any experiments on this, and also for the authors, for the same author when the name appears differently, like C. Philistus and Christus Philistus, would you be able to merge them? Yeah, the that's, that's a very good question. We actually had some previous study by the other student, Xiao Xing Ying. He did this Wei Wang problem. That means it, actually he found 14 Wei Wang share the same entry. He wants to split this 14 Wei Wang into each one, say who author which papers. Yeah, I cannot say it's perfect because it works for DDRP. It doesn't work for, say, PubMed. Okay, why? Because the PubMed, you probably know, computer science probably gets three or four authors. PubMed, one paper can have, no, I don't know how many, but once I got my buffer like a 50, I could not hold all the authors. I have to extend the buffer to more than 50. Okay, so with that, actually sometimes, another thing for, for PubMed is, many PubMed papers, they only have first initial. They don't have the full name. Then you get more collision. It's very hard to distinguish them. So that's the reason, you know, for example, even I went to, to, you know, like NSF. They don't ask me to put a whole name. It's a J. Dao Han. I got lots of very strange papers. Say, that's J. Dao Han's paper. I look at it and say, definitely that's not my paper. Right? So the, the, there are lots of collisions. And you need new algorithms. But this one definitely helped. Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question. Yes? Yeah, time for one, one more. In your yeah. clustering, Yes. An iterative process. Yes. It's possible that it could converge at different places. Yes. Does it? Or does it always converge at the same one? Yeah. Actually, that's a, actually for any clustering algorithm, you probably know even you run k-means, you finally may converge into a different point. You can say suboptimal. And for this one, that's the same thing. You, you, you have the same problem. Okay. That means nothing is... Perfectly. What you need actually is you run it multiple times. You evaluate those, uh, you know, distances. You say which one is somewhat better. Okay. But I could imagine that your network data yeah. might be such that actually always, in principle, it could go different ways. But in fact, the network is able to always bring it to the same place. Do you have any 
data. Yeah, experience. that's a very good point. Actually, the, the key, for example, you look at the conferences, the top conference is very dedicated. You always do it right. For example, you say Sigma is database or Sig IR is IR. You will never get confused. But once you go down to lower, lower one, you run different uh, seeds or different things. Those marginal you know, things become a little muddy because you, based on diff that's the exact power of this rank clustering. The top ranked one actually will not go wrong. But the lower ranked one, you know, depends on your initi initiation. Sometimes even. So that you argue that it, even if it doesn't converge perfectly, it converges where it's important. Yes, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, that's a very good summary. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.